I'm so fairly certain, <laughs> given the title of the talk, you came here because you're just like, I have a mean inner critic and I need to know how to get that little heifer out of my head. <laughs> right? Now, here's the interesting thing, and we're gonna do, so the paper, don't take notes on the paper, or anything like that. The paper is for an exercise specifically, so keep it for that. Um, but you'll kind of find that um, you're not alone in this room. If you've got a mean inner critic, uh, you have got about 150 or 200 compatriots who are just like, yep, I'm with you. I'm like, right there. So if you're tweeting, and you'll have to excuse me, it's so cold in here that my nose is actually running. <laughs> I'm like a puppy, my nose is really cold. Um, so if you're tweeting, uh, there's the tweet information, and it's also at the bottom of every, just about every slide, so you won't miss it that way either. Um, so let's, I'm just dive in here and want to talk about reclaiming your creative power. So here's my question to you. What do you think it is that blocks you from doing your best work, your best creative work? Is it your teammates? <laughs> is it your managers? Is it the ever moving deadlines? Is it your processes? Is it your tools? And we know that we're, because we're at Adobe Max, it couldn't possibly be your tools. <laughs> it's not the tools, no. Especially now that there's Control Z <laughs> in Photoshop, right? Like the best, did you guys realize that that was like the most applause the whole morning? <laughs> I mean, like everybody else got on the stage, they're like, oh, that's, oh, you can like link the stuff and you can have voice command, that's nice. Hmm. Oh. Control Z. Ah! <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> so it's not, so it could be any one of those things, right? But here's what I think. I think that the biggest thing, the biggest block between us doing our best creative work is right here. It's between our heads, it's between our ears, it's in our heads, right? And it is actually Sarah Blakely, who's the founder of Spanx was just like, negative self-talk is the number one barrier to success. And I was just like, well, I knew that. I wrote a 350-page book about it. <laughs> and the thing is, is that when you've got these voices that say to you, oh, right, I'm not, I'm not good enough. My work isn't good enough. I'm not talented enough. I'm not creative enough. My ideas aren't unique enough. Other people are so much more talented than I am, right? It'll never work. People will laugh at me. People will judge me for what I do. Then you end up feeling awful, right? And how can you move forward and do amazing work when you've got that committee of people in your head? As a matter of fact, it's may maybe for you it's not a committee. Maybe for you it's just this little small voice that comes up Annoyingly, of course, at the wrong times, when you're like trying to do the most impressive work, when you've got client work or you've got like teamwork for you inside your company. By the way, how many people here um, work in a team, work in a company? Yeah, okay, and how many of y'all are freelancers? So not that many, okay, but so you know. Either way, even if you work in a company, you ostensibly have a client, right, that you're trying to, to work for, that you're trying to please. And it's always at that time when you really actually want to do the best work, where you really want to kick the most butt. I'll just say kick the most ass, because I can. It's Adobe Max. We got neon, neon insignias and stuff this year. I can't, if I can't say ass, I don't know what I can do. But when you want to do that, that's when that voice comes up. And sometimes it's this like little chirping voice over your shoulder, like, eh, eh, uh-uh. And sometimes it's loud and booming, and it takes up your whole consciousness. And sometimes it is like a committee, where it's just like they're all weighing in all at the same time. OK, sorry, I just want to take you back for a moment. Does anybody remember the movie When Harry Met Sally? Yeah. Do you guys remember the scene when Billy Crystal says that he had a dream that he was in the Sex Olympics, and his mother was in the, uh, as a judge, <laughs> as a German, like an East German judge? <laughs> I always think of that when I think of the committee. So 
<laughs> your mother or your boss or your manager is disguised somewhere in the committee, right, and is weighing in on your work. And so, in stark contrast, when you're in flow, it's a totally different thing, right? As a matter of fact, I want to hear from you. What does flow feel like for you? What does creative flow? Tell me, just start shouting out some words. Say, you lose track of time, yes. What else? In the zone, yes. What else? Adrenaline. Did you see, I hear relief? Relief, yes. What else? A ton of really good bad ideas, which you don't even care about because you dismiss them, right? You're just like, oh, okay, yeah, that didn't work, boop, right? What else? Energy, Energy yes. What else? Forget to eat. Forget to eat. <laughs> On a roll. I heard, did I hear passion back there? Yes, she said, mm-hmm, girl, that's me. <laughs> passion, right? And so when you're in that creative flow state, you tap into this kind of this creative power, this source, right? The source of energy that propels you forward. You forget to eat, you lose track of time, you're totally in the zone, you feel passionate about what you're doing. And so imagine, imagine for a moment that if you were in this state of creative flow, that meant that that voice is gone, right? Essentially that means that that voice, those voices in the background are gone. So imagine what it would be like what you would be create, able to create without that voice. Imagine what you would be able to do, what you would be able to come up with, what ideas would come forth if that voice was silent. And then imagine, because you work in a team, imagine what it would be like to work with other people whose voice, their voice was silent. And imagine the ideas and the, the ideation and the collaboration and the great kind of creative synergy you would be able to have with other people whose inner critics were silent. And then imagine how the company culture could potentially change. How you could get to this place where you had this great culture of collaboration where people were actually, first of all, secure about, about their own creativity, their own ideas, didn't feel threatened by other people, tried to pull out the ideas from other people, and then started this, sparked this kind of culture of creative collaboration. Imagine what you'd be able to produce, the products, the services that you would be able to produce for your end users, your clients, whatever. Like, pretty amazing stuff. Well, the problem is, is that the inner critic is, is small and, 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 and small-minded and holds us back from doing any of those great things, holds us back from putting things <laughs> forward, and actually makes us censor ourselves so that we commit something that's called ideocide. <laughs> that we kill our ideas before they see the light of day. And then you can imagine what happens. Other people around us are doing the same thing. And so the ideas that finally do actually make it through, you can imagine they're going through a battle trying to get forward. Oh, 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 oh. And then they finally get to the surface and they're freaking exhausted. Oh my God. And kind of anemic. And like, <laughs> uh, I think um, uh, we can do a uh, thing. Right? Not like a nice strong idea that just comes, just comes forth with no impedance. With no, impedance is a good word. I'll just keep with that. I'll just stick with that. And also, imagine people have imposter syndrome because of this. People think, I mean, here we are at this conference and everybody's like, I'm not creative enough. The creativity conference. And, I'm sure a lot of you are like, yes, j other people are creative, I just do that thing, right? I just do that thing in Photoshop, or just do that thing in XD, or I just do that thing in, in, in uh, you know, Illustrator. And a lot of us end up having imposter syndrome. We deny what we do, we downplay. As a matter of fact, I was at a conference a couple, last year, and I was talking, it was a conference for instructional designers. And I was talking to a guy, and I was like, oh, so how long have you been doing, you know, you're an instructional designer? And he was like, yeah, I do a little instructional design. <laughs> and I said, oh, really? Well, how long have you been doing it? And he said, about 10 or 12 years. <laughs> yeah, just a little. 
So, like, if this guy's 40 years old, that's literally like a fourth of his life. It's just a little instruction design. So we downplay ourselves, right? And so creativity, like I was saying before, all of those words that you just said, the losing time, the forgetting to eat, the passion, the relief, the flow, the energy, the happiness, excitement, all of that stuff, I think, is power. That's what we need to get back in touch with. That's what we need to reclaim. And sadly, the inner critic actually blocks this creativity and blocks this power coming through us. <clears throat> And this is actually not just mere speculation. Um, actually, they have done studies where they put people in an MRI machine. There's a great TED talk by a guy named Charles Lim. It's called Your Brain on Improvisation. And he puts people in M MRI machines, gives them a little keyboard, and has them do improvisational jazz. And it showed that there's a part of your brain called the prefrontal cortex. And that part of your brain is in charge of self-evaluation, self-judgment, behavior modification, that part of your brain powers down and becomes quiet so that the other part of your brain where all the ideas are and how things work together and move together and go together, that all comes out and plays. So, like I said, creativity is power. And I'm not just saying this based on the fact that I go and I give talks like this all over the place. I lead workshops with people. I do a lot of exercises and get people, help get people unblocked but also because it's happened in my own life. As a matter of fact, if it hadn't happened in my own life, if I hadn't silenced my own inner critic, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you today. So what had happened was, <laughs> it was 2009 at South by Southwest. I was there, I was lamenting to a friend of mine just two days before this picture was taken. I was sitting in my hotel room, with my friend Jen, and I was a hot mess, you guys. I'm not kidding, I was sitting there, I was like almost, you know that like when your face is all hot and puffy because you're holding back tears? Like that's how I was, and I was just like, Jen, I just wanna be a speaker. I wanna be a speaker on the web design circuit. What does a sister have to do? To be a speaker on the web design circuit, do I, have to, do I have to sign a blood pact? Do I have to give away my firstborn? What do I have to do? And she was like, well, most people I know have written a book. And I was like, Shh. girl. I was like, look, the only book that I feel qualified to write is a book on HTML, and Lord knows the world doesn't need another one of those. <laughs> right? Like, they all say the exact same thing. And she was like, I'm just telling you what I know. And I was like, okay, whatever. So imagine my surprise when two days later, 10 minutes after this picture has been taken, I run into this woman, her name is Wendy Sharp. She was one of the main acquisition editors at Peach Pit New Writers Press, a major technical publishing company. And she asks me, an important question that you've probably been asked a thousand times already in the last three days at this conference when you meet somebody new. What do you think she asked me? What so what do you do? <laughs> now, here's the other backstory. I was unemployed. I was unemployed, I was living off of unemployment and I was living off a credit card and I was looking for work, which is one of the reasons why I went to South by Southwest. I was like, great networking opportunity. So you can imagine what ended up happening is that my brain <laughs> split into like three entities. One was like my like loser, like you know, insecure self, and the one was like my mean girl inner critic, and the other one was like my confident self. And my loser self was just like, I can't tell her that there's nothing going on but the rent. <laughs> I can't tell her I'm looking for work, what I'm gonna say, she's gonna think I'm a total loser. And then the mean girl was just like, yeah, she is. <laughs> You can't say any of that stuff. And don't even say anything about writing a book, even though you've been wanting to be a writer since you were 20. What you need is a job, like a job job, like a paying mortgage job. You don't need to be writing a book. And then my, my confident, secure self, what I also would hazard to call my creative self, was just like, zip it! Both of you guys, I got this. And step forward and I said, in complete confidence, you know, let me tell you what I want to do. Not what I'm doing, but what I want to do is I want to speak more and I want to write more. And she says, well, we 
I'm looking for somebody to write a book about how to troubleshoot CSS code. And I said five words that would change my life, which is, I could write that book. Now, you guys heard all the stuff that was going on in the background. If I hadn't stepped forward, if that part of myself, that confident part of myself hadn't stepped forward, I never would have had, a year later, my book, The CSS Detective Guy, come out. Hey! And a month after that, I did my first international speaking engagement at the Future of Web Design in London. Ooh, ooh. What? Hey! So, I'm saying this also from experience. So here today, you guys are here today, didn't come here to only talk about myself. I am gonna tell you a few more stories. Because you know, they illustrate things. But also, I wanna get you guys back on that path. I wanna get you guys getting to the point where you can get, shut those two up, and that you can step forward when it's time and you can actually take the reins and do something that's really important to you and really meaningful and have you start doing the work that you really, truly love. So let's talk about the inner critic and where does the inner critic come from? So the inner critic, I believe, is a combination of the fears that we have about ourselves that are already there that are kind of triggered and exacerbated and actually like kind of you know, made stronger by the negative things that we hear from other people. So the negative things you hear from teachers, parents, coaches, siblings, other peers, anything like that. If you've already got a fear about that thing, and sometimes even if you don't, it'll go in, it'll take hold, and then it'll start sending out its noxious roots. Our inner critics, as you know, can be absolutely brutal. And the reason that this happens is because our brains are very, very highly susceptible to criticism, especially when we're younger. Back in our early years, that's when it's just like the most, just a sponge for all this stuff. What ends up happening is we've got something that we're built with, and it's called negativity bias. And that is our brain's capacity. What it, we do is we scan the environment constantly for danger. Like right now, you're just like, is she going to eat me? <laughs> Not today. Maybe later. If, or maybe, uh, you know, if lunchtime isn't any good, then, you know, run. <laughs> but negativity bias, we scan the, 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 the scene. We scan for danger. So imagine this. Let's just go back in time for a little bit. We're hunter-gatherers out looking for food. They do that. You know, they did that back then. They kind of walked like this. <laughs> I'm looking for food. And we see a blueberry bush, beautiful, resplendent with blueberries, nice and ripe, ready for the picking. And then from underneath the blueberry bush comes a snake. Oh my God. It might even be more like, ah! Because you know snakes. Unless you're just like, oh, I love snakes. It's a nice snake. But probably you'll be back going screaming. And then right after the snake comes out of the bush, this beautiful butterfly flits by. Now, if you thought about that area in the future where you're out and hunting and gathering again, because that's what they do, would you remember the snake or would you remember the butterfly? The snake! That's because of fear conditioning. Fear conditioning, it takes anything that we find that's dangerous, whew, puts it in a part of our brains that's called implicit memory. And that is memory that we literally don't have to think about, we don't have to try to recall, it just drives our actions subconsciously. So you wouldn't even, you might not even remember that there had been a snake there. But your brain, it's in there. And it'll tell you, and it'll try to keep you safe. So that's the bad news. We are built with that, that comes, comes in the box. That's the bad news. Now I'm going to tell you the good news. The good news is, is that we also come with three power tools that I like to think of, three mental power tools that will actually start to counter the effects of fear conditioning and, and negativity bias and taking in those negative things and like make, having them drive our behavior. You guys want to know what they are? Yeah. 
Okay, good, because I'm going to tell you. <laughs> the first one is neuroplasticity. Our brains have the capacity to change in the face of new stimulus. So that's just learning, right? You do this all the time. Something happens, you go, oh, okay, your brain adjusts, and there's actually neurons and everything being laid down, new tracks being laid down when you learn something. So imagine the first time you, lear you learned Photoshop, you're doing Photoshop, and you're like, I don't know where to find anything, I don't know how this works, I don't even know what this number means. <laughs> what do you mean by feather? Jesus. <laughs> and tolerance. Right? But then after a while, you get to do it, and next thing you know, it's just like second nature. Okay, do, 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 do this, do, 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 okay, we're done. Right? And then in the next year in the reveal, they'll be like, you don't have to do anything. You can just think that, and it'll, <laughs> <laughs> it'll do that. I could just learn this. So neuroplasticity is what's happening all the time. Our brains are doing this all the time. They're always setting down new neurons, new connections. Why, it's called... Uh, Hebb's law, that uh, neurons that wire together, fire together, or fire together, wire together, excuse me. And so that's always happening in the background. And so imagine, because of this, with neuroplasticity, the great thing that it is, is that if you have a habitual thought that you're doing all the time, and you're walking down this path, and you're walking down this path just like you are wood in a forest, what happens? The, and the path gets worn, exactly. Auto, the path gets worn, and you go on autopilot, precisely. However, let's say you're like, don't want to really be thinking this thought pattern anymore. I want to do something else. And you start walking down another path. And you're walking down the other path and stuff like that. What do you think happens to this one? Same thing in the forest. Gets grown over, right? And after a while, you can't distinguish that from the rest of the forest. Well, guess what? Same thing happens in our brains. We start thinking different thoughts. The old thought patterns start to fade. Really helpful. And you can control this with attention and focus. Attention and focus has been called the gateway to neuroplasticity. So this is what I want you guys to do. Here's your first hack of the day. You ready? I know, it's a great picture, too. It's a kitty. A kitty looking at a rock. Okay, sorry. I have one more little aside, and this is going to be the morning of asides. Did you know that cats actually can't see anything that close to their face? Yeah, cats have like, their, their vision is like really good, like at a distance, but up close they actually can't really see stuff that well. Okay, total aside. Back to what we were talking about. <laughs> this is what I want you to do. Here's your first hack. You guys ready? Okay, I want you to put your hands up. Put your hands up. Put your, no, like that. Sorry. Like this. <laughs> I just got excited. I got thought about Beck, and I was just like, oh, I wish I hadn't been the first. <laughs> okay. So you've got your hands up. I want you to focus on your left hand. Okay? Just put all your attention and your focus on your left hand. Oh, there it is. Now I want you to shift slowly your attention and your focus to your right hand. Is your left hand still there? Does it matter to you? No. Okay, you can drop your hands. Now, you think you're like, I don't know what that has to do with thinking. <laughs> imagine your hands being thoughts. And imagine you're thinking a thought where you're just like, it's no good, and I can't, and I don't, and uh, they're going to laugh, and they're judging up. And you're like, no, actually, I want to think something different. You could actually just put your hands up and say, okay, here's that, no, 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 da, 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 this thing I don't want to think about. And you choose a different thought and actually make yourself focus on this one and deliberately put your focus and attention on this thought. It can be just a quick little thing that you do to snap yourself out of it. And if you need to do it over and over again, you do that. Just remind yourself. And just like sometimes, and you might even get to a point where you're just like, okay, and you just put your hands up and you know that's a signal to yourself to start thinking something different. The second power tool is mindfulness. So mindfulness goes along with this, this uh, shifting focus hack, right? Because mindfulness is what allows us to realize that we are thinking a particular thing and that we have the choice to think something else, right? Mindfulness is our ability to actually kind of almost stand outside of ourselves and say, oh, I'm thinking that thing. That's interesting, 
right? And to get, have some attachment and have some, some space from it. So you can use mindfulness to be aware of, oh, okay, I'm doing that inner critic thing again. All right, maybe I'm, I'm gonna choose to do something else. I don't have to stay here. I can actually do something else. You've got a lot of thoughts that you can be thinking during the course of the day. You can choose which ones you do. Last one is self-compassion. So self-compassion is actually, I think, in some ways, one of the most powerful out of all of these tools. Because self-compassion helps us maintain our emotional equilibrium, excuse me. And it has like just a crazy array of benefits. So like when we're feeling inadequate, self-compassion actually helps us feel more secure and accepted. And it also decreases self-consciousness. It actually releases oxytocin, which is the cuddling comfort hormone, right? And anytime you get science in there for me, I'm like, I am there. It also lessens depression and anxiety. It increases grit and emotional and mental resilience. And it actually is something that's been shown to be used with people who are actually high achievers. One of the things that they, they use to actually make the achievements that they do is self-compassion. So it's pretty cool. So here's the second little hack I'm gonna give you, which is the self-compassion, I call it the self-compassion template. So imagine for a moment that you have a really, really dear friend, somebody that you love a tremendous amount, and they come to you and they say, you know, I just really am not feeling very good about my work, and I just, I don't feel like it's good enough. And you've seen their work, you know their work is kick-ass, right? And so you've seen it, and they're just like, I don't feel like it's good, I don't really feel like I'm creative enough, or my ideas are unique enough, and I just, I just need your support. What would you say to that person? Think of what you would say to that person. Think of the feelings that you would have towards that person, the feelings of empathy, the feelings of sympathy, the feelings of caring. Think about all of those, and then think about taking that and turning it back to yourself and being the friend to yourself that you would be to anybody else that you care about. That's your self-compassion template. So we've done all of that. You've got your three power tools. Now, since we're talking about meeting your inner critic, let's meet your inner critic. So you may <laughs> be in a place where you're just like, <laughs> I don't have an inner critic. As a matter of fact, I have a friend. So my book came out last year, and I was sending all these emails ahead of time, being like, my book's coming out. Oh, you guys, support a sister. And I had a friend who is an amazing friend. I met her like 25 years ago in France. She's Swiss. She does like whatever she puts her mind to, she does it. She's like, I'm going to be a midwife. I'm going to go to school in England. I'm going to be a midwife. Okay, and then I'm going to go to Africa and I'm going to like help people in like these like impoverished areas and like, you know, give them tools for, you know, birth stuff, midwife, midwife stuff. <laughs> you know, the technical terms. And so <laughs> Sandra... Sandra writes back an email and she says, Dear Denise, I don't think I have an inner critic. I'm not going to buy your book. Love, Sandra. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, okay. So there's like the Sandras of the world, which is like 1% of the population. And then there's like 99% of the rest of us who have an inner critic, who basically is just like, oh yeah, my inner critic sends me text messages all day. Like, oh, by the way, good morning, you suck. <laughs> it's like, we're on, we're on like instant messenger, like it's not a thing, it's, we, we're close, we're deep. So in case you're like somewhere between Sandra and everybody else, here are some Mad Libs to get you in touch with that inner critical voice. Okay, if I put my work out into the world, then people will think it's not good enough. I'm not creative enough. I can't, you know, use a new tool because I'm not as smart at learning new things as others. You can fill in the things. You don't have to say what I'm, what I'm saying. You know what it is for you. If you know what it is for you so well that you're like, I don't need that, then this is what I want you to do for everybody. Take your piece of paper. You're like, oh, we're finally going to use it. Yes, take your piece of paper. And I want you to either use the Mad Libs or you're like, don't need it, getting text messages all the time. 
or write down your main fear around creativity, whatever it is. Just one. Don't sign your name on it. Don't put your Twitter handle, your IG handle. Just one. Write it on your paper. And then when you got your done with your paper, I want you to crumple it up in a ball. And when you've got it crumpled up in a ball, just hold I, There's no way that I can say this well. Hold your balls in the air. I don't, <laughs> show me your balls. I, I don't know. So just hold it, hold it up, and we'll wait till everybody, those of you who are perfectionists, one, just one. Don't overthink it. When everybody's ready, we all have our things. Come on, we need it. This is a, this is a team effort. It's a team effort. OK, we got everybody? Come on, perfectionists. <laughs> okay, I want you all to stand up. Ooh, and I'm going to film this this time because I always miss it. Okay, turn. So the people in the front, I want you to turn towards the back. The people in the back, you just stay. And on the count of three, don't do it until I say get to three. And then people just start throwing things. On the count of three, I want you to throw it to the back. Okay, but you, hold on. Hold, please. Hold, please. Okay. On the count of three, you guys ready? One, two, three. <laughs> All right, oops. <laughs> it isn't fun until somebody loses an eye. So grab one close to you. Yeah, no, it's just, we're not just throwing it. Yeah, I forgot to say throw it as far as you can. Distribute them. Distribute them. If people don't have any, share them around. Make sure people get them. We need a lot in the front because there aren't as many people in the back. Share and share and share. Almost everybody, everybody should get one because everybody threw one. This is why you all need to do it. OK. I'm so curious. I want to hear what you got. This is like my, one of my favorite parts of the, of the thing. This is why I'm dancing around on the stage. You got your, seriously? That's crazy. That's very rare. All right. What we got? Execution. Execution. It's actually one of the first times I've seen this one. I can't make good animations because I'm not a good illustration artist. If I draw what I want, people will be afraid. <laughs> be afraid, be very afraid. Dated. Hey, retro is back, though. I overthink things. These are great. If I make a decision, it'll be the wrong one. Blank slate, no ideas. Not as good. Inadequate. I think your friend's in the audience. Right. <laughs> Sandra's in the house. Failure. Oh, and it's so pretty, too. It's like really big. I love it. I'm going to use that one for you later. People won't take my ideas, good or bad, for whatever reason. System is rigged, but I keep going. <laughs> Conspiracy theorists. Not being good enough to stand out. Two Sandras in the house. Not being good enough. Time. Thank you. I was like, I can't decipher that one. Not experienced enough. OK, so this is a good sampling, right, of what people say. OK, let me do this. Everybody's looking so expectant. He's like, do me, do me. I can't write a book because I'm not an expert, and there's too many similar. Ooh, whoever that one was about writing the book, come talk to me later. because. I've done it twice, and I can tell you, bullshit. <laughs> fail, laugh, confident, win, smart, try. Try, win, fail. Yeah, this is like very creative. It's actually very creative. I like it. One more. Boop. That's what it says. It just says boop. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, save those for me when you're done. Just leave them on the seats. I'm going to come and collect them. This is data for me. It's all anonymous. You guys didn't put your Twitter handles, I hope. If not, I'll be like, hey, girl, I'll send you a little t direct message. Hey, I just want to give you a hug because it's not true. Okay, so you can see, I hope you feel like you're not alone, right? Like you've got a whole room of people who said maybe the exact same thing that you said or said number two or three or four or five or ten on your list, your internal list of long, long list of, of things that are your, your fears around creativity, right? Now, how many of you guys think, well, my inner critic is helpful. My inner critic is actually there. It pushes me to be better. It pushes me forward. It motivates me. Okay, so... Here's what I want to offer to you for this before we get into some more kind of nitty gritty stuff. I believe that there is a difference between an inner critic and an inner evaluator, okay? So your inner critic is just mean, right? Your inner critic is the one who's sending you text messages like multiple times a day that's just like, you suck, it's not good enough, I don't even know why you're trying to do this, you're not gonna stand out, it's not original enough, you need to go back to school, blah, blah, you should have been a doctor, blah, 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 blah. That's your inner critic. Your inner evaluator is not mean. Your inner evaluator is the part of you that has been doing this for so long and that knows what's good, right? Your part, there's a part of you is like, you know quality. You know when something affects you. You know when something touches you. You know when something's executed well, right? And that inner evaluator is more like a coach and more like a guide that says, hey, this is close, but maybe you should just tweak this little thing. Why don't you try this? Maybe if you just do this one little extra thing, You'll, you'll, get, you'll get closer, right? Your inner evaluator is not mean. Your inner critic is mean, right? So that thing that pushes you forward, maybe you can say, you start to make a de delineation in your head between what things, when you're just having that mean voice and when something's pushing you forward to try to make yourself better, okay? All right, let's talk about this whole thing, this whole process for what we're gonna do from now on is all about stepping into your creative, your creative power. So, next little bit. Reclaim your brain, stop, stop self-sabotage, say that five times fast, own your expertise, and amplify others' ideas. So, by the way, at the beginning of every section, and sometimes in the section, these things came from this exercise. I do this exercise a lot, I like to do it with audiences, I gather them up, exactly the same things that you did. All the, these are you guys right here on the screen. So let's talk about reclaiming your brain. So I have a little story I want to tell you. So when I was 12, I went to summer camp at Camp Whipper Will. It was a Girl Scout camp, and that's me with my best friend, Emily. And so we were there, and we had an arts and crafts session. And during this arts and crafts session, I was very proud of myself. I drew a superhero mermaid. What? I mean, nothing like what's her nose who draws, draws Wonder Woman. But I was 12, so I feel like, you know, I get a, I get a pass. So I drew the superhero Wonder Woman. I'm a superhero mermaid. And I'm sitting there, and I'm showing it to my friend Emily. I'm super proud of myself. I'm like, girl, look at what I drew. Oh, my God, snap. And from out of nowhere, this other girl in my group, whose name was Heather, <laughs> comes and walks up behind me, looks over at my shoulder, and looks and goes, it looks like a frog. Now, <laughs> I wish I had done this. I wish I had had the training. You know, I came from a small college town in Ohio. My parents were both scientists. I didn't have this kind of training, but I wish I had. Oh, really? Oh, no, Emily, girl, hold my rings. <laughs> but I didn't. Instead, I felt like this. Inside, I know, very tiny. 
so very little. And the thought that I had in my head was maybe I'm not as good a drawer as I think I am. So I was suffering from a couple of things. The first one was creativity denial, where I was actually doubting my own ability to be creative, right? And then the other one was judgment dread, where I was just so afraid of criticism that I just couldn't bear to show people my work. You guys are like, oh my god, get out of my head. You're welcome. <laughs> so here's what I suggest for you. Here are the beginning of the hacks as I break my presenter clicker thing. So here are the beginning of the hacks. The first one is this. You guys have heard of confirmation bias, right? Confirmation bias basically means if you expect to see something, you will see it, right? If you're having a phenomenal day, and you wake up and you're like, you know, like they do in the commercials. Ah, everything's wonderful and you're skipping down the street and you find a dollar and then you find like the perfect parking space and then you go to work and everybody's like, yay, you're here! And then your boss gives you a raise. <laughs> Make it happen. You, is, part of that is because you're expecting, from that first moment, you're expecting great things to happen and they just keep happening. Whereas in stark contrast, you have one of those days where you're just like, oh my god, I can't believe it. And then the coffee machine breaks and you don't get your coffee. And then you're trying to find a parking space and somebody cuts in and gets right in there and you're just like, ah, ah. And then you get to work, and then they're like, oh, by the way, we just moved the project up like until tomorrow, so everything's due tomorrow. And you're just like, no! Confirmation bias. You started off expecting horrible things. After your coffee maker broke, you were like, all right, that's it. The day is done, <laughs> right? And then it just keeps getting progressively worse from that. Confirmation bias, luckily, is neutral. It is not go to the negative or positive positive, negative, it is neutral. So we might as well use that to our advantage. So have you guys ever heard of a swipe file? So back in the day in marketing, like in the marketing industry, when people saw like really cool marketing snippets and stuff like this, you probably do this with artwork with like really cool, you're just like, oh, that is designed so well. Like you probably have like a file of like really nice business cards. You're like, look at how well it's designed. I mean, it's like made of metal, what? I actually have one that I got from years ago. I was like, I can't get rid of it. It's gorgeous, right? You have things that inspire you. You keep them and stuff like that. Why not keep a file, a similar file, of things that every time somebody says something nice to you, you keep that. You keep all the emails where somebody said good job, or you keep all the text messages where somebody was like, it was amazing to work with you, or the client that says, I loved that thing, or somebody sends a tweet, or somebody sends a direct message, or somebody sends something on Instagram, or somebody posts something on Facebook. You take screenshots of all those little babies, and you put them in a folder, and when you're having a down moment, you start doubting yourself, just cycle through those things. I guarantee you it will help you feel better. I have my own version of a swipe file, and that is when people tweet nice things during the talks, I take them, I put them in as like testimonials on my website, and sometimes I'll just go and I'll just like read it and I'll like try to remember. Oh, right, 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 okay. I do this thing and I do it well, right? So swipe file of support, great little tool. Another thing. so. Lovely little Heather rolling up on me, completely unsolicited opinion about my artwork. I don't even think she could draw a stick figure, bless her cotton socks. <laughs> but you know, I was like very sensitive, it was very susceptible. I didn't see it coming. A lot of times we don't see criticism coming, but a lot of times we do see it coming in the form of an employee annual review or something or a meeting with a boss. So if you're in a situation 
where you're going, you know that you're probably going to be receiving some kind of criticism of some sort, a couple of things you can do. One of the first ones is, is to actually structure it, is to make sure you communicate to the person, okay, I need feedback and I need it in this way. Tell me, focus on this thing, this thing, and this thing. Don't have them weigh in on everything and start talking about the alignment of the stars and how that's wrong and everything. No, I need these three things. That's what I need you to give me. Also, you can take notes. Take notes and ask questions so that you actually get really clear and almost detach from it so it's almost like it's somebody else and you're just trying to get information. What's the information that I need to actually move forward with this, right? And so, sorry, this was this one. And, and so the other thing is just be curious. Like, like I said, ask questions and be curious and try to get like, oh, well, really? Well, why do you think that is? Well, tell me more about that. OK, well, what's your suggestion then? What were your ideas about this? And just try to gather as much information as possible. What ends up happening is a lot of times, good 80, 90% of what people say you can toss out. And then you can just focus on what's relevant and what's actionable and what you can actually do. All right, last one for this section, and then we're gonna move on to the next section. Reprogram your mind, we can do this. So this whole talk is essentially about ways to reprogram your mind, but this one is a particularly good one in my opinion. So there is a woman at the University of Chicago, her name is Susan Golden Meadows, and she does a lot of research on the effects of gesture on speech and vice versa and on thinking. And what she does is she has people work with children and she has them teach them um, mathematical equations, but she has them explaining it using gesture. So she'll have them say, like subtract or add, right? What she found was that the children understood better with gesture and even if the words that the person was using to describe were different than the gesture, they paid attention to the gesture and not the words. <laughs> not only that, but there's a really cool uh, little snippet of the video where a woman was talking to a little boy and she was saying to him, well, what was he wearing? Tell me what he was wearing. And the little boy's like, well, he was wearing like um, pants and like a jacket and like a green hat. just because she did this with gesture. Crazy! So this is what we can do. In order to silence our inner critics, we can use a gesture that we use all the time. You guys probably use multiple times today already. Seriously, you're probably like in this like, can she just move on? It's the swipe left gesture. But think about this, way before digital devices came into play, You've been doing this forever, right? Nah, nah, I don't want that. Do you want that? Nah. <laughs> yeah, you're like, oh yeah, no, move on, move on, move on. Get out of the way, right? We use that gesture all the time. So why can't we use it to reprogram our brains and start deleting concepts and ideas and thoughts that we don't want anymore? So Heather rolls up on me and says, and Lily, and then, I start thinking, I'm not a very good artist. And then I think, nope, stop, delete. Nope, cancel. So you have a thought, or you start thinking repetitive thoughts, and you're like, I don't want to think that anymore. Try it. Just try thinking it and then saying, no, delete, cancel. Try it. So that is reclaiming our brains. I know, right? You're just like, I just did the exercise. I know it's real. So let's talk about stopping self-sabotage. So I have another story to share for, with you from my childhood. Can you see? Where's Denise on the picture? FYI, I'm the tall black chick in the back. <laughs> You're like, I couldn't tell. So right now, at my full-grown height, I am 6'1". When I was 14 in this picture, I was 5'11". 
Okay, I know. Oh. <laughs> so I was playing basketball, and here's the interesting thing about it. I loved practice. Practice was amazing. I loved gaining the skill. I loved doing all the stuff. But the games were a completely different story. I mean, you guys. I would get this trepidation and this fear between, in front, before every game. And I'd put on my uniform and stuff, and then I'd be out there practicing, warming up, boom, doing my foul shots, boom. And then we'd do the little break, bulldogs. And then I would hide <laughs> on the bench. Now, I had it down to a science. Y'all don't know. I had it down to a science. I wasn't like the last girl on the bench. You see my long legs sticking out after that? No. I was like two or three girls in. Strategic. Right? And then check out my posture, my cross legs. I look like I'm going to have tea, right? <laughs> I'm just like, oh, this is going to be a good game. Somebody pass the scones, please. <laughs> and I would sit there trying to hide, but invariably, I would sit there, and my coach would call me down. She'd go, Denise. And she'd do this, and I'd try to go up. And then I would try to plead my case. <laughs> Miss Canine, I would say, please, don't put me in. Don't put me in. I'm not ready. It's too early in the game. I know we're ahead, but can you just put me in the last, put me in the last quarter. I'll play the last quarter. I'll play in the next game. Put me in the next game. I'm just, I'm, today, I'm, just, I'm not ready. Now, why do you think, as a tall black girl, I was afraid to play in the basketball games? Boom. Expectations. I was terrified that I was going to get on the floor and that people would be like, I thought that was LeBron James's daughter. I thought she was going to do something. Why is she like missing the shot and everything? And so my fear and my thought was, is that everybody's going to judge me for not being an awesome basketball player. And so I just tried to stay on the bench as long as I possibly could. Now, here's the interesting thing. I'm at that point in time, I'm a 5'11 <laughs> black girl <laughs> in a basketball game. I couldn't hide if I wanted to. Man, I was probably super conspicuous on the bench. I thought like I was hiding. People were just like, why is she sitting? You know, why is she not on the floor? I don't understand. I'm going to write a letter to Ms. Canine. She's not doing her job. I was up there trying to hide, and I didn't step into what I naturally was born with. I am athletic, and I am strong, and I have really good hand-eye coordination. Another little tidbit for you guys. I've never shared this before, but I'm so proud of myself. Once I was getting my hair done, back when I had hair, I was getting my hair done, and I was sitting there, and there was a curling iron on the counter, like an electric one, curling iron on the counter, and it just started to fall. And I was sitting like this with my arms on the counter, and the curling iron was falling, and I went, boom, and I caught it on the handle, <laughs> not on the, on the thing. I just I caught I didn't even think twice about it. I like, literally just went, I was just like, I was falling, and I was like, Shoo. I caught it, and I was like, that was probably not the smartest thing to do. <laughs> my hand-eye coordination is on point, y'all. <laughs> I trap things when they're falling on the ground. So I have all those things. I have those natural talents. I have those natural skills. What about you? What natural talent and skill do you like literally just came out of the box with? You don't have to think about it. As a matter of fact, I will guess that you may not even know what it is because it comes so easily to you. It's like breathing for you. And then other people will say to you, oh my, how did, what, did you just catch a curling iron? Like what? And you'd be like, oh, it's not a big deal. Whatever, I do that all the time, right? <laughs> think about those things. Even go and ask people, get the feedback, and get in touch with your <laughs> uniqueness advantage, right? Get in touch with that, because that thing is the one thing 
This is what I like to tell people, and I'm, like, I'm kind of passionate about this concept. There is literally only ever going to be one instance of you in the whole entirety of time and space. What? There has never been you before you were born. There is you now. And then when you're gone, there is never going to be you ever again. You are the only person who has your combination of skills and expertise and experiences and thoughts. You're the only one. And so that means that what you have to share with the world is, the on is only what you can share. So get in touch with that thing or those things and start to capitalize on that. Yeah, you're not going to be like Questlove. I, you know, I want the pick. <laughs> the pick is on point, right? I don't have enough hair for it. But you don't have to be Questlove. You just be you. I know, I just feel like I have to have a moment after that. It's like going to church, isn't it? <laughs> Amen. Amen, that's why I call myself a creativity evangelist. <laughs> well, that's right. So, the other thing I was experiencing was high self-criticism. I was thinking anything that I did wasn't gonna be good enough, it's gonna be boring, it's gonna, be, it's gonna suck, they're gonna judge me, I'm just not going to try anything at all, right? Now here's an interesting, other interesting thought for you. Just because you're thinking something doesn't mean it's true. Again, <laughs> what? Because you think that it means it's true because you're thinking it, but it doesn't, right? So keep that in mind. When your inner critic is up there yapping at you, chirping over your shoulder, loud booming voice, committee, East German judge, etc. When your inner critic is really loud, it's almost like you're on a radio station or you're listening to a podcast. Well, guess what? You can use your brain and you can change the station. It's almost like you're just like, wait a minute, this is like the advertising on this station is horrible, right? I want to listen to a different station that's telling me different messages, and you can imagine doing that. There's something called the cocktail party effect. You guys remember, heard of that? So like when you're at a cocktail, you can imagine when you're at a party, you probably had this at Max at the Bash last night. You have all these conversations going on around you. You can focus on the person that you're talking to. And then you can also shift your focus and you can listen in on other things and then you can come back and you can focus. If you were in a crowd and you're with your friends, I bet you had somebody called Marie. And you were like, and they were like, way the heck out. But you heard your name out of all the things that were going on. You heard your name, right? We have this ability to tune things out, to be able to tune things out. So this is my recommendation. Here's the hack. You guys remember Shrinky Dinks? Yeah. <laughs> imagine your inner critic and imagine it shrinking. It's up there yapping, bah, 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 sending you text messages, whatever. And imagine you just shrinking it in your head. Or you can shrink it. You can crush its head. I'm crushing your head. I'm crushing you. And you can do that. And that will help kind of lessen its effects. That's a particularly fun one. <laughs> So with the basketball thing, back to this, my self-talk was just crazy, right? And so one of the things that we can do is that we can give ourselves a self-talk reboot. So we can change it from where we're looking at ourselves kind of like, ah, I'm being super critical, to actually getting to a point where we're actually feeling pretty good about ourselves. And the way we can do this is, to actually be like a coach. So kind of like the inner evaluator, right? And kind of like my coach, Pam Canine, bless her heart, she believed in me and she kept trying to put me in the games, right? You can have a really supportive voice speaking to you. And so when you're having a, 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 a moment, instead of talking to yourself in the first person, like instead of thinking to yourself, I am going to do so-and-so, you would do something called self-distancing, and you would refer to yourself in the third person. So you actually refer to yourself by name. Now check this out. LeBron James, speaking of LeBron James, <laughs> LeBron James actually uses this technique a lot. And I don't know if you guys ever heard, but sometimes in interviews he'll refer to himself as LeBron James. <laughs> Seriously. But it's because he uses the self-distancing technique. 
So it's really cool. So for example, let's say that you're about to give like a presentation to your client, you're about to unveil something that you've been working on or to your team. And so what you would say is, somebody give me your name. What do, give, me, give me your name. Betty? Becky. Becky. So you would be like, all right, Becky, you're going to go and you're going to give this presentation. There's nothing to be nervous about. You've, got, you've been preparing. You've got this, right? And then you would say, just remember the points that you want to do. Becky, just remember the points and you'll be okay. And then what you want to do is you want to finish it off with an affirmation, right? Affirmations actually work, but like kind of usually in a very specific context. And then so you want to say, Becky, I know you're, you're doing to do great and you're going to wow them. You've done a great job in the past and I know this is going to be no different, right? And so you use this whole thing. It's not me telling you this. It's yourself telling yourself this, right? So that is a particularly effective technique. Now, let's talk about owning your expertise. Oh, the person who wrote the thing about the book, this one's for you. This story is for you. So, I was 12 and I was 14 and now I'm 24. I'm graduating from the University of Washington. I went to school and got a degree in uh, international studies. And so I'm talking to my father after I graduated. And he you know, he's asked the questions that fathers ask when you graduate from school. And he was like, so, what do you want to do? Now, I had been in this program that was like a really stringent program, had a lot of writing, and I even had several professors come up and say to me, hey, you know, your writing is really good. I even had a professor ask me to be a writing tutor at, the writing, at one of the writing tutoring centers. So I said to him, much like my, one of my idols, Maya Angelou. That's me, by the way, talking to Maya Angelou, just in case you, <laughs> just in case you didn't know. It's me, Maya Angelou. I know, right? <laughs> Thank you. I said, Dad, I, I'd like to be a writer. And he, being, you know, as dads do, looks over at me at the top of his glasses, and he says, you know how hard it is to get published? Now, you may be thinking to yourself, well, you know, maybe your dad wasn't, like, very educated, or like, maybe he didn't, like, you know, finish school. Maybe, like, full-collar worker or something like that. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but, you know, maybe it's coming from a place of not really understanding, you know, the process. Well, let me tell you some, a few things about my dad. Okay. My dad was the first person in his family to graduate from high school. He was the first person in his family to graduate from college, and he got a degree in aeronautical engineering. At the age of 21, he got his pilot's license in 1959 in pre-civil rights Detroit. And my mother was actually his first, his first uh, passenger. He did aeronautical engineering for a while and decided he didn't want to work for anybody else, went back to school, got a doctor of optometry, and then, for fun, he built and flew experimental aircraft. That airplane is the second of three airplanes that he built in his lifetime. My dad was no joke, okay? It was not a game with my dad. But despite all of the accomplishments that he did in his life, right, all of the barriers he broke through, he believed three really prevalent myths about creativity. That artists starve, that creativity is something that you do in your free time and not as a job, and that very few authors, if, all, if at all, get published. And so I took what he said to heart. I'm 24, I don't know anything. And though so I thought getting published is hard, I'm just not gonna try, right? I'll forget about being a writer. So, I was comparing myself, first of all, I was taking in this information, and then I was comparing myself to great people, right? I was comparing myself to successes that were already proven successes. And so one of the things that I like to tell people is that you can't compare your insides to somebody else's outsides. We are seeing, and especially in this age of social media, we are just seeing everybody's highlight reels, 
all of the trips to Paris and all of the camel rides in the Sahara and all of the laying in the Dead Sea soaking in Iceland and hot pools and whatever and all the book deals and all the thing. That's what we're seeing. But that's, we're not seeing all the stuff that happened before that, all the stuff that inside, all of the snowballs with fears written on them that they have themselves, right? So one of the things that I like to think, keep in mind when I'm looking at people and I'm starting to feel envious and I'm starting to compare myself and I'm finding myself wanting is to look at them and to look at them as an opportunity model, not a role model, but an opportunity model to think, hey, they've done this thing, so that means that this thing is possible. Lily Singh started off making crappy videos, and now she's like hanging out with The Rock, which, <sighs> oh, Lord have mercy. I was like, do I just need to be videos to do that? Like, is that all I need to do? Because, yes, please. He's so big. <laughs> Excuse me for a moment. <laughs> you guys are so great, by the way. <laughs> so look at them as an opportunity model. Look at them as what is a range of what's possible. And then you can take them and you can study from them and you can learn from them. So these are two buddies of mine, Lavia J.A. and Francesca Ramsey. Yeah, <laughs> met them like ages ago. Met Francesca in Miami back in like 2008. Met Lovey at Blogalicious at, in 2010. Back when they're just, you know, folks. And our books came out somewhat in the same time, but they both have like these amazing marketing machines behind them and their books are like bestsellers. And so I've had many moments of being envious until I look and I say, first of all, I don't know all the things that they did and they've got a marketing team. I'm gonna learn from that. I'm gonna set it up so that the next time I have a book that comes out, I have the marketing is like super planned out and advanced and super mapped out and not something that I just like tack on at the end. Right? So I learn from them, study them, and learn them. The other thing that I was suffering from when my dad was like, you know, what are you gonna do about this publishing thing? Was that same thing. You guys just, you saw, you heard these already, right? Not a unique enough, not original enough, not enough, somehow not enough, not good enough, etc. So when you're struggling with feeling like you're enough, usually what happens is that you haven't acknowledged what you've already done. So my recommendation, my little hack for you, is to celebrate your successes. And since we're here, we're all together, and we're having a lovely time, this is what I want you guys to do. Put your, put your, put your stuff down, and I want you to do this. So congenitally blind people, when they're feeling triumph, go into a position, it's called fiero, which is putting their hands up like this. They've literally never seen anybody do it, and they do this. So this is what I want you guys to do. On the count of three, we're gonna do this twice, just to like feel great. <laughs> is we're gonna say, I'm awesome. <laughs> okay? So on the count of three, she's like, okay, I'm for it, I'm ready. <laughs> Give it to me. So on the count of three, say, I'm awesome. We're gonna do it twice, so you can get into the groove. Ready? One, two, three. I'm awesome. God, I gotta get a picture of that next time. Okay, and we're gonna do it one more time. Woo, shake it out, shake it out, get loose. Okay, you ready? Oh, I'm gonna get this, this is like so cool. Ready? One, two, three. I'm awesome. So good, so good. Now. This is not just like feel good, like, oh my God, I went to go see about the inner critic and then I got like a Tony Robbins thing. <laughs> I am tall like Tony Robbins though, so was, you know, you can understand it. But really what this is about, this is neuroscience. When you congratulate yourself like that, your brain squirts out dopamine. And when you do that and you start congratulating yourself more, guess what, your brain gets addicted to that. And so it will want that. So when you give yourself that kind of acknowledgement, you tap yourself on the back, you do a little dance, your brain goes, this is great, I want more. And it'll it reinforce 
and reinforce that sense of success. Yes. Last little thing on this one. I want you to be and share your brilliance. Kind of back to the uniqueness advantage thing. So you guys have all got talents. And even if you think you're not experienced enough and you don't know enough, guess what? You know more than the person who is the step behind you. Right? So be and share your brilliance. How many of you guys put out some kind of content? Blog posts, articles, et cetera? OK, needs to be more of you guys, number one. How many of you mentor people? Yeah, Good. needs to be more of you all, right? Mentor people, how about when somebody new comes into the company that you like act as kind of a guide for them, right? Just do that. Do more of that. Not only will that get you in touch with what you know, but that will also make you feel good about connecting with other people and helping other people. It'll get you outside of yourself and get you into a place where you're being actually what I call selfful to be selfless, right? So do that. Share your expertise. It's super important. Last little bit here, and then we'll, we'll start wrapping it up. I probably, probably should wrap it up now, but it's the last little bit. So talking about amplifying others' ideas. So everybody's got an inner critic, right? Everybody struggles with this. And like I was saying kind of at the beginning, imagining what would happen if people showed up with their full selves, if people showed up strong and confident about their own ideas, and then we're taking those, and then you guys had your, you had your cool, great ideas, and then you just start riffing with each other. You just start bouncing things off of each other. So one thing to remember, one thing to think about, is sometimes we can get so nervous and so ca caught up in our stuff, and our inner critic stuff, that we actually over-talk. You ever been in a meeting and you're just like, oh, well, and then it's what we could do. I mean, I just, I was just thinking, and, I was, ah, ah, and you just keep talking, trying to like make things sound good. Sometimes over talking mutes others. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to find a partner. I seriously want you to find a partner. Somebody sitting next to you, somebody sitting behind you, whatever. Somebody sitting behind you. Hey, easy peasy lemon squeezy. Somebody, yes, you guys are nice. All right, I want you to think about something you're really excited about. Something you're like, you're going to learn something new, you're going to go somewhere, you're going to do something, you're going to eat something delicious. I don't care what it is. Think about something you're excited about. What I want you to do is to tell each other about the thing you're excited about it with a lot of energies and gesturing and stuff at the same time. <laughs> this won't last long. Go. A lot of energy. Energy. <laughs> Same time. Did you find somebody? Okay, okay. Stop. Stop. How was that? It's awful, right? You can't hear anything. The other person's not listening. You can't hear anything. Okay, this time I want you to do it again, but this time you're going to switch off. Right? One person talks, the other person's super supportive. Yeah? Really? Uh-huh. Okay. Ooh. Uh-huh. And then when you kind of feel like you've said the thing, then switch. Okay? Go. Okay, stop. How was that? Better. Why? Tell me why was it better? More engagement. What else? They were listening. What else? How did it feel when the person was listening to you? It felt good, right? You felt like supported and validated. So remember, when somebody's sharing their ideas, really show up and be present and to be an active listener for them so that they feel safe and supported and that maybe they'll get the cue and they'll do the same thing for you. Now, there's that. Here's another kind of little tip to bring out the brilliance of others. So everybody's got great ideas. Keep your partner. Keep your partner. Everybody's got great ideas, right? 
Sometimes ideas, great ideas, come from very unlikely sources. And sometimes they come from very disparate things, right? So this is what I want you to do. I want you to think of something, think of a thing. You think of the thing, your partner thinks of a thing. What I'm going to have you do is you're going to say your things at the same time, and then you're going to figure out how you can make an actual something out of the two things together. And you're just going to yes and. You're not going to be like, no, we can't do that. You're just going to be like, yeah, and we can do that. Oh, yeah. And then you're going to come up with this like composite thing. OK, ready? On three, one, two, three. OK. I saw some people looking expectant. What did you, what did you come up with? I mean, not, not everybody got to finish, but what did you come up with? Yeah. What did you get? Poop emoji tattoo. That's awesome. A tattoo and a shih tzu. A poop emoji tattoo. What else? We came up with a plot for the next Sharknado movie. Okay. Okay. They were laser laser rocket sharks. Laser rocket shots. I love it. But we invented a scooter that has a little oven for delivering food. A scooter with an oven for delivering food. Amazing. So. You guys can see you do this, and how did it feel to like do that just kind of a playful thing? So you can use this tool, thank you. You can do this tool. You can use this at meetings. So if you're in a brainstorming meeting, for example, and things are like, and people are getting out like that, you're like, hey, why don't we just do this mashup thing really quick? And do that, and you can see how like the kind of the energy of the room like lit, lightens, like lifts. Everybody starts laughing, it starts fun, and then it gets you in that place where you're actually amplifying each other's ideas and tapping into each other's brilliance, and then creatively collaborating together. Okay, let's get out of here. I'm gonna finish this up. So, those stories I told you in my own life were examples of me standing on up to my own inner critic, right? And because I did so, I ended up actually doing a lot of visual art, or a, few, a bit. This is a, a mural that I did um, at my high school, like right as I was graduating from high school, I did a map of the world for um, uh, one of my favorite teachers, who she asked me to, and I said yes. It took me 250 hours to do that. It's like 10 by 20, really long. Um, but it was amazing, and I felt confident about my ability to do it. When I banished my inner critic about basketball and I finally stepped into being the tall sister that I am, strong, hand-eye coordination, et cetera, I actually ended up becoming a really strong basketball player and also volleyball player. And it got me to the point where I was comfortable going in on, on a court and having everybody look at me, whereas before I had been terrified of that. And that translated into me being able to stand in here in front of you and not feel like, oh my God, they're gonna eat me, right? And then, finally, by silencing this inner critical voice about the abil my ability to be a writer, whoever that was, if they haven't left already, I ended up becoming an author serendipitously, not just once, but twice. Both of my book deals literally fell into my lap. Is it hard to get published? No, it's not. Not in my experience. If somebody's gonna be like, is it hard to get published? I'll be like, well, I, don't, I might not be the right person to ask because both book deals fell into my lap, right? And all of that combined brought me to the work that I love and put me here to stand here in front of you. But this isn't about me, this is about you. What are you gonna get from this process, right? Are you gonna get freedom and expansion and creativity and empowerment and contribution and helping people maybe a sense of community. You could get all of that by silencing your inner critic and stepping into your creative power, reclaiming that, right? You'll be a stronger co contributor, I think. You'll be able to share your ideas without fear of being judged, without the fear of them not being good enough. Your idea may be the idea that sparks other ideas. It doesn't have to be great and beautiful and perfect and well formed out. It could just be the merest tiny seedling of an idea. But it could be enough to blow something beautiful in with the people that you work with. You could be a stronger collaborator. You can actually help other people get to that point, 
right? Pull that genius out of other people. And then you could be a stronger leader if you're in charge of teams or something like that. You can recognize where people have their inner critics. You can help them get past that so that they can put out their brilliance and their genius. You can leave a legacy, you guys. Now, as you may have guessed, this is not one of those like easy peasy things where you like you swipe left and then you're done, right? It's a constant process, it's continuous improvement. And even I am still struggling with it. When my book came out, I didn't reach out to influencers and stuff like that like I should have. And because I thought, I don't want to bother them. They're really busy. I don't want to bother them. So I'm still working on it too, even, even, after, having, even after having written the book. By the way, the book is available in the bookstore downstairs in the pavilion. <laughs> FYI. Okay. And everything that I've talked about is in the book and then like tons, tons more. So go get you, go get you a copy. And I have bookmarks for you too, if you want. So you may not have thought it was possible. You may have thought my inner critic's gonna be sending me text messages forever and I'm just used to it. We're gonna have coffee in the morning, every morning, whatever. She gets me a latte, it's good, right? You may not have thought it was possible, but now you've got an expanded toolbox. Now you've got some things to use and if you get the book, you'll get an even ex more expanded toolbox. So this is gonna help you get past your blocks, right? You've got a bunch of stuff that you can use just from, now, just from today. And then, <laughs> you can make magic. It's like the best skit. And you can have an impact. So here's what I think, just to finish this up with. I believe we all have the potential for greatness inside of ourselves, right? But when we have the inner critic present, ever present. It's like it snips away at all of those buds and all of those places where leaves could be unfurling, right? But we can actually get to this place where we stop that snipping and we start to stand in our magnificence. So the power is in your hands, in your brains and also in your hands. So I want you guys to stand up and I want you to think of your Heather I want you to think of that time where you totally self-sabotage yourself and you didn't put yourself forward. I want you to think of somebody like my dad, some authority figure that told you something that was completely incorrect. And on the one that was from your childhood, from the Heather, I just want you to swipe left, just delete, do, delete. And on that time you totally self-sabotaged yourself and you keep thinking those thoughts, I want you to delete those. Cancel, delete, bye, bye. And then on that authority figure who gave you the really wrong information, I just want you to cancel that. Delete. Boom. Thank you, you guys. You are awesome.